The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everybody and happy Thursday. Um, pleased to have everybody on for our next edition of Coffee with Kalefi. Today we are doing a very interesting topic about air to water heat pumps and hydronic systems with one of our favorite speakers, uh, Mr. John Siegenthaler. Uh, we're very happy to have him here and, uh, and then I'll pass things over to John. Well, thanks Cody. Uh, glad to be with you yes. folks. I understand we've got a good audience today. Uh, one of my favorite topics, uh, applying air to water heat pump systems in hydronics. Where do, where do heat pumps and hydronics intersect? Well, obviously today we've got geothermal water to water heat pumps. Uh, they work well. There's a lot of them out there. Uh, but keep your eye on the air to water market. I think it's going to be a, an expanding market and we're going to talk about the, the technology behind it today and we'll also take a look at some market factors that point to uh, increasing market share for this. So we'll start off with what's going on with an air to water heat pump. Well, any heat pump takes low grade heat from some source. It could be outside air. Uh, in the case of a geothermal, obviously it could be the ground, a water well, a lake, but it's low grade heat. It's, it's heat at a temperature that would not be useful for space heating or for uh, domestic water heating. And what the heat pump does is it brings the temperature of that heat up to a point where we can use it for space heating and domestic water heating. So in an air to water heat pump, uh, in the heating mode of operation, we're starting with an air handling section up here at the top. We have a fan and an evaporator coil. Uh, we're sending outside air through that coil. The refrigerant in that coil is several degrees colder than the outside air, even when the outside air is below zero degrees Fahrenheit, uh, the latest air source technology can still extract low grade heat from that very cold air uh, that evaporates a refrigerant. The refrigerant goes down through a compressor. Uh, it, its temperature and its pressure are increased. Then the high temperature, high pressure gas goes over to a condenser. And in the case of an air to water, the refrigerant, the hot refrigerant now is giving up its heat to a stream of water that is coming in uh, from the hydronic system. And there are different ways that that interface can be made, different shapes for the heat exchangers. Sometimes the heat exchanger might be indoors. In other cases, it'll be outdoors. We'll talk about the difference in those configurations. But essentially, we're handing off that high grade heat to a stream of water. And from that point on, anything that we can do with modern hydronics is, is, a, is a possibility. And then finally, the refrigerant, after it's given up its heat, it goes through a thermal expansion valve that drops its pressure and its temperature, and it goes back up to the evaporator for another pass. In the cooling mode, it's a similar idea, except we're extracting heat from a stream of water, again, coming from the hydronic cooling system. We're going to use the uh, refrigerant to absorb that heat. We'll send the refrigerant through the compressor, uh, the reversing valve is basically what controls which direction that refrigerant goes between the heating mode on the left side of the screen here, cooling mode on the right, and ultimately we're going to dump that heat. Uh, in this case, we're dumping it outside through the uh, coil up at the top of the unit and again a fan that's bringing outside air through. There are some air to water heat pumps that have other options such as dumping that heat into a swimming pool or even putting that heat into an auxiliary load like domestic water heating rather than simply uh, throwing it away to the outside air. So the basic refrigeration cycle in an air to water heat pump is a very familiar cycle. Now there are a couple prominent uh, configurations for air to water heat pumps. Uh, the term monoblock, it's actually a European term, but it refers to a self-contained unit. The monoblock type heat pumps come factory charged with refrigerant. They're designed to go outside and the, all that you bring out to them is the uh, hydronic interface. Uh, typically in a cold climate, it'll be piping carrying an antifreeze solution. In a milder climate, uh, it is possible to just bring water out to these units and of course electrical power. But the heat pump itself, all those, um, components that we just talked about in the vapor compression cycle of a heat pump 
are all contained in that outdoor unit. Uh, the schematics over on the right, in a warmer climate application, I know some of this is done in Europe, where freezing is possible, but it's, it's infrequent. Uh, in some cases, they will bring water directly from the system to the outdoor unit. In a cold climate, many of the manufacturers don't really want to hedge a bet on if it's uh, substantially below the freezing point, you have a prolonged power outage, obviously water in any outdoor piping is in danger of freezing. So there's a couple ways to deal with that. One is you can use a heat exchanger and then do a antifreeze-based circuit between the heat exchanger and the outdoor unit. In other cases, you can eliminate the heat exchanger and just use an appropriate percentage of propylene glycol throughout the entire system for freeze protection. Now, this slide shows some examples of monoblock style heat pumps. Uh, these are all products that are available in North America at this point in time. Uh, you'll see similarities. Uh, basically, it's a cabinet that sits outside. I like to see them elevated above the ground at least a foot. Uh, obviously, in a, in a deep snow area, you don't want uh, snow covering where these fans are. And by getting them up off the ground at least a foot, it, it does improve it as far as grass clippings, leaves, bugs, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at all five of these images, you'll see similarities here uh, in terms of fans that pull the air through the outdoor coil unit. And then typically over on the, uh, the right side or the lower part of the cabinet is where the compressor is, uh, as well as the, uh, the other components in the refrigeration system. And the piping and electrical interfaces are either on the side or on the back of these units. The other common configuration for air to water heat pumps is called a split system. We have a refrigerant line set that goes between an indoor unit and the outdoor unit. Uh, typically, the compressor is in the outdoor unit, although I'll show you another slide where um, that is not the case. Uh, the, ref the nice thing about a split system is there is no water in the outdoor unit, so there is no need for antifreeze in the system, which in my, in my line of thinking, that, that's a significant advantage. The indoor unit, oftentimes it comes with a circulator as well as an expansion tank built into it. Uh, just a couple design details. That circulator is not necessarily large enough to pump the entire system, just like a circulator that might come with a packaged boiler. The assumption is that that circulator is going to take the flow through the heat pump and get it to some type of an interface, either a buffer tank or perhaps a hydraulic separator. And from that point out, another circulator will take that fluid through the system. Same thing about the expansion tank. The expansion tank could be large enough for some assumed amount of piping, but if you're doing a large system, especially with a buffer tank, where you've got 100, maybe even 150 gallons of fluid in the load side of the system, you're going to need a larger expansion tank. Uh, you can certainly leave the expansion tank that came with the unit in place, but you'll be supplementing it with another tank. So again, uh, split systems uh, are available from several different manufacturers. Now, I put this one in, this is a manufacturer up in Canada, Nordic Heat Pump. I put it in just to show a variation on a split system. In this particular unit, the compressor is inside. Uh, there is a DX or a refrigerant line set to the outdoor unit. And really the only significant or large components that are in the outdoor unit are the outdoor coil, which would be the evaporator in the heating mode, and the fan. By moving the compressor and the electronics and some of the other components inside, you're bringing it into a, a, a more serviceable, uh, service-friendly environment. And uh, the length of the compressor lasting longer is improved there. So it's a similar configuration, just uh, a difference in, in where some of the components are located. So let's talk a little bit about performance on these units. Okay, here's the uh, very simplified diagram of what's going on pretty much in any heat pump. We have low temperature heat starting over here on the left being absorbed. Uh, again, with an air to water, it's, it's going to be coming from outside air. Uh, so that's our significant low-grade heat input. We certainly have to have some electrical input to operate the compressor. So we have two inputs here, Q1 and Q2. Basic thermodynamics, you add the two inputs together, 
and that gives you the total heat output Q3. And then the, the index that is used to judge the performance of just about any heat pump is called the coefficient of performance, uh, abbreviated COP. It's the ratio of the output energy, which is the useful product of the heat pump, divided by the electrical input. The higher we can get the coefficient of performance, the more energy we're getting per kilowatt hour of electrical input. So it's desirable to maximize the COP. And one of the ways we do that is by creating a, a very compatible balance of system that can operate at relatively low water temperatures. So when it comes to interfacing to a hydronic distribution system for heating, the lower the water temperature is, the better that heat pump's gonna perform, the higher the seasonal coefficient of performance is going to be, okay? So <clears throat> basic way to think about coefficient of performance or think about what a heat pump is doing, uh, I call it temperature lift. We're basically taking heat from outside air, free heat, and we're lifting the temperature to some useful value that we can use for our load, either space heating or domestic water heating. The greater that temperature lift is, the lower the coefficient of performance, or stated in reverse, the smaller we can make the temperature lift, the higher the COP of the heat pump. So obviously we can't do much to change the outside air temperature, but as designers, we can affect the water temperature that our distribution system operates at. And we're gonna, we're gonna dive into that a little, bit, a little more later. Now, the same thing is true in a cooling mode. We have a temperature lift between the chill water and the outside air. The, the smaller that temperature lift, the, the higher the performance of the heat pump in cooling. And we measure that by an index called energy efficiency ratio, EER. Uh, the European market, they'll sometimes refer to this as the cooling coefficient of performance versus the heating coefficient performance. In either case, the, the smaller the temperature lift, the better the performance of the machine. Again, we can't change the outside air temperature, but anything we can do to bring the chill water temperature up a few degrees, we still have to retain good moisture removal at, at a coil. So we can't, we can't necessarily get up into the, uh, maybe into the 60 degree temperature range, at least as a starting temperature. But if we can operate our coil at 50 degrees, entering chill water temperature versus a 45 degree chill water temperature, we're going to see an improvement in the energy efficiency ratio. Okay. Now, one thing that happened earlier this year is that the uh, EPA recognized air to water heat pumps as what's called an emerging technology and they awarded it, the emerging technology award. Um, I'll admit I don't know a lot about this award, but I was certainly glad to see that air to water heat pumps are on the radar at the EPA. And over on the right there, they've given you some uh, indications of what performance level they're looking at. And those are uh, that, that heating COP of uh, 1.75 at an outdoor temperature of, of five degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, many of the products that are in the market now can equal or exceed that performance rating. So <clears throat> um, where this leads in the future, I'm not sure, but if you wanna take a look at that website there, uh, that can give you some more information. So, uh, it's certainly favorable that, as I say, that uh, this technology is on the, the radar at the federal level at this point. So that leads us up to our first poll question. Are you planning Perfect. to use an air to water heat pump in the upcoming installation over the next 12 months. And it looks like we've actually got a surprising amount of yeses here, John. Um, we've got 45% saying yes, 55% right. saying no. Okay. That's, that's a good pretty start. promising. Yeah, that's it's very that's promising. Yep. Uh, may, maybe we can make that yes column go up a percentage point after the end of this. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. Um, so uh, what's going on globally with the air to water heat pump market? Uh, there is a publication that comes out of Japan uh, called JARN. And uh, each year when I go to the AHR show, I usually pick up a copy of it because one issue really lays out the global statistics on the air to water heat pump market. And a couple of years ago, 2017, uh, over two and a half million air to water heat pumps were sold. 
And the, the breakdown, the largest market by far was China. I think about a million air to water heat pumps went in, were installed in China in 2017, uh, Japan, and then Europe uh, coming in at around 11%. Uh, the breakdown was about 70% are split systems versus the monoblock. Uh, and uh, one of the questions we received earlier, one of the uh, uh, pre-webinar questions, uh, was a question asking whether some of the major Asian players in the uh, ductless mini split market also have air to water heat pumps. And the answer is definitely yes. Uh, companies like Daikin, Mitsubishi, Fujitsu, and, and so forth, as well as in the European market. You'll see some uh, names there. I'm sure you'll recognize Wiesmann, Bosch, Volan, major boiler manufacturers. Uh, they are diversified into air-to-water heat pump offerings. And uh, actually, the Canadians, there are uh, at least three or four companies doing air-to-water heat pumps in the Canadian market right now. Uh, the market growth uh, is in part based on incentives for carbon reduction. And uh, also, many of these newer generation air to water heat pumps use either variable speed compressors for modulation and capacity control. Some of them use a technique called enhanced vapor injection, which uh, basically uh, subcools the liquid refrigerant coming off of the um, condenser unit and just allows that refrigerant to go into that outdoor coil at a lower temperature and thus be able to absorb heat from lower temperature air. So when we look at this product category globally, there's a lot of activity and you'll see it's in the traditional strong hydronics markets, the European market and the Asian market. And um, this statistic kind of floored me. I, I apologize, I don't recall which journal this came out of, but I took a clipping here and uh, in 2017, there were actually slightly more heat pumps sold in the German market than there were boilers. And I, I say it kind of floored me because Germany is really one of the epicenters of hydronics and boilers have been by far the dominant heat source in those systems for many years. Uh, again, the interest in moving away from fossil fuels, uh, as, as well as government incentive programs. Uh, if you look at kind of the breakdown there, air source and water source units accounted for about 35%. Uh, geothermal was the smaller percentage of the German heat pump market that year. So more air to water systems. And, and again, if you look at the the way the Germans do heating, uh, hydronics is, is by far the dominant method. So bringing a air to water heat pump and as I say, mixing it with especially the low temperature hydronic systems is a, uh, it looks to be a very good combination. So we've, we've talked about the Asian market, the European market. What about growth in the North American market? What are some of the, the trends that would point towards that? So let's start off with net zero houses. There's a lot of interest in that these days. If you follow uh, building publications, if you follow uh, energy related publications, you'll see a lot of articles and a lot of interest in net zero, both at commercial level as well as residential, uh, where we have net metering laws, uh, putting some photovoltaics up on the roof and essentially banking surplus electrical energy uh, during the summer or just pretty much during any sunny day when the, the PV panels are putting out more power, more energy than the house is using, uh, combining that now with an electric heat source. Uh, again, a heat pump in, in any of these forms that we've talked about, it seems like a very natural machine to integrate along with photovoltaics, okay? Uh, one of the interesting things about these houses is besides the photovoltaics, so they, they have very good building envelopes, uh, high R value insulation, very high quality air sealing. So the space heating loads are actually quite low. And in some cases you could potentially pay more to have a gas meter on the building than, than what you actually pay for the gas you use. Um, so even though there's gas service perhaps at the curb or at the street, 
the incentive is is not necessarily there to just automatically connect these houses to gas. So many of these houses are going with all electric for both space heating, uh, cooling, and also for domestic hot water. So again, the heat pump plays very naturally into that scenario. So what are some of the characteristics of these buildings? Very low design loads, uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 BTUs per hour per square foot of floor area as a design load. So think about it, uh, a 2,000 square foot house with only a 20,000 BTU per hour design load, coldest day of the winter. Uh, there really aren't boilers on the market that have capacities that low. Now there are boilers that can modulate that low, but on part load days, that 20,000 might be 10,000 or might be 5,000. So there is a challenge there to meet that type of a load with a fossil fuel heat source, even with good modulation. And uh, heat pumps, again, come in capacity ranges that would, that would fall in there very easily. Um, internal heat gains, okay, room by room zoning is important to control overheating. Internal heat gains in these buildings can make temperatures change quite quickly compared to, I'll, I'll just say, less efficient building envelopes. Uh, another characteristic, um, internal heat flow through open doors and uninsulated partitions, it helps equalize temperature differences. So you have such high R values in the thermal envelope that maintaining significant differences, I'll say perhaps 10 degree Fahrenheit differences between one room and another, especially if the doors are open, uh, it, it's virtually impossible to do that because of the high thermal resistance in the envelope. This is an interesting characteristic. In some cases, the capacity of the heat source may be set or determined by the domestic hot water requirement as opposed to what the space heating requirement is. We've actually seen where providing, for example, for <clears throat> three full bathrooms in a house at a at an assumption where all these bathrooms are in use simultaneously would easily exceed what the design heating load is. And that that's pretty much a reversal of the traditional uh, situation where space heating was the dominant reason to bring uh, hydronics in and, and hydronic, the boilers were sized around the space heating load. Uh, oftentimes uh, the, the domestic water load was just an ancillary, by the way, we can also do domestic water type of thing as opposed to the, the dominant load. Uh, because of low air leakage, many of these houses have heat recovery ventilation systems. Uh, one uh, observation is that these houses can all be heated with radiant panels, uh, floors, walls, and ceilings. However, in the case of floors, keep in mind that these floors are not going to get as warm as they would in a, in a building that has perhaps a 20 to 30 BTU per hour per square foot load. Uh, oftentimes the surface temperatures of these panels will only be in the low to mid 70 degree range. Now that's not a problem from a performance standpoint. That's actually really good for the heat pump. But the reason I bring this up is if you're selling clients based on the idea of very warm floors, uh, you know, a lot of people really like that idea. Well, don't don't overpromise how warm those floors are going to be. The floors will only get as warm as they need to to satisfy the thermostat. So we're we're meeting our load requirement, uh, but if somebody expects the floor to be 85 or 90 degrees Fahrenheit, as it would perhaps 20 years ago in a, in a more uh, energy wasteful building, uh, that's just not going to happen with these types of buildings. Uh, I mentioned it was difficult to find combustion type heat sources uh, that are well matched to this load. Uh, definitely would uh, require a buffer tank if you're oversizing or just picking the smallest available boiler. Uh, I mentioned monthly gas uh, service charges. The, if you will, the meter rental for a gas meter uh, could be a very significant part of the total bill. It might even be more than what the total gas uh, consumption is. And because these are, they're going for net zero, they have to produce as much energy as they use. And really the only practical way to do that is with solar uh, PV up on a roof. So you'll see a strong trend for all electric uh, houses. And here's an example, uh, this one builder out in the Seattle area. Uh, just some of the statistics on these buildings. 
Uh, they're built with structural insulated panels. So I think eight inches of foam in the ceiling, probably at least eight inches, maybe more than that. Uh, very high R values, low air leakage rates. And you'll see down here in the, the lower right corner, there's an air to water heat pump as the uh, heating and cooling source for that building. Uh, and a 9.5 uh, kilowatt photovoltaic array is the, uh, the electrical generation for that system. Okay, now another trend, the geothermal heat pump industry is highly dependent on subsidies. Um, I, I don't want anybody to get the idea that I'm trying to uh, be uh, negative about geothermal heat pumps. We've designed several of those systems and I've actually had one in my own house. They've worked very well. But fact is that that, that market is heavily dependent on subsidies, both at the federal level and in some cases state levels. And an interesting thing happened uh, a few years ago. The original tax credits that went into place in 2009 expired at the end of 2016. And during that time, uh, during the next year, 2017, the US ground source heat pump industry went down about 50%. And that was actually cited on the geoexchange.org uh, newsletter. So uh, a significant drop in the market share. Now, that's the bad news for the geo industry. The good news was that back in 2018, in February, there was a uh, massive spending bill that went through Congress. Um, there's a picture of what it looked like. I forgot the actual name of it. I think it was over 2,000 pages. And not only did it uh, reinstate the tax credits at the same 30% level, it made that reinstatement retroactive back to the actually the day after the original credits expired. So that was uh, that was a day when the uh, the geo industry probably broke out the champagne. But really, for uh, contractors, uh, mechanical uh, installation companies, it's the uh, it's the usual uh, roller coaster ride here. Uh, you have a heavily subsidized technology, and that can certainly support a market. But when the when the subsidy gets pulled. And it's it's starting to expire actually at the end of this year is when the federal tax credits on geothermal heat pumps transition from 30 to 26 percent the following year 22 and then they're then they're gone assuming nothing changes at the federal government uh, so it's going to be a challenge for the geo industry to uh, uh, readjust as they go through less subsidies uh, for their product and Several of those companies uh, do understand the reality of that, and they do uh, offer or will be offering air to water heat pump systems as another product category. Now, um, air to water heat pumps are significantly less expensive to install, and it really comes down to the, the earth loop. Uh, there are many different ways to put earth loop systems in. If you happen to own several acres of land and uh, you have an excavator available, you can dig up and put the uh, put the piping in, create horizontal earth loops. If you're in a much smaller lot, maybe in a suburban lot with half an acre, and you have uh, granite under you, it's going to be a very expensive operation to drill down through that granite and put in vertical earth loops. Uh, in my area, just doing some price estimating, uh, vertical earth loops run about three thousand dollars per ton, and that would that would include the uh, boring and the insertion of the pipe and then regrouting. It does not include uh, the headering of the system. As you see in that photo up here, these are actually vertical boreholes with the uh, vertical tubing coming up and you'll see they're fused into headers. Well, you obviously you have to dig the trench for that back to the building. You have to buy the pipe. You have to fuse together the joints and so forth. So the earth loops can get expensive depending on, again, land area and what, what's the practical technique. Some cost estimating that we've done for a, a given capacity geothermal system in our area, if the cost was X, uh, we're finding that an equivalent capacity air to water system would run anywhere from about 30 to 50% of X. So substantially less expensive. Uh, nothing really changes inside the house as far as 
perhaps a hydronic radiant panel distribution system, what changes is you're setting a condenser unit uh, either on a rack or in some cases perhaps even on um, a frame that attaches to the building as opposed to bringing in an excavator and tearing up the landscape and so forth. So the cost of the earth loop makes a big difference. And uh, if it's an existing lot, uh, perhaps it's been landscaped, uh, we've got a lawn, we've got trees, uh, certainly we've got in some cases uh, utility lines, we've got septic systems and so forth. Uh, we've got to be careful how we're digging and uh, you can see a major disruption there uh, to the landscaping. And that really needs to be factored in to the cost of the system. Uh, in the lower left here, you see a, a nice lawn that's been uh, dug up to put that piping in. Uh, nothing wrong with doing that, but certainly that dirt has to be put back in. It has to be graded. It has to be seeded. Uh, those costs should all be factored in realistically because they're, they're simply not there with an air-to-water heat pump. Uh, if you've ever witnessed vertical borehole drilling, uh, it's interesting to watch. And you can see by these uh, these fellows uh, on the rig up there, um, you're not going to go home with clean clothes at the end of the day. It's it's a pretty uh, messy process. Uh, the tailings that come out of those boreholes really need to be moved off site. It's not something that you can just rake it off and throw some grass seed on it. Um, so there are definitely these uh, these extra costs associated with basically digging up the ground, putting the pipe in, and then you know, re, um, re-establishing it back to the original condition. Now, <clears throat> going back to our uh, net zero houses, as home space heating loads get smaller, the domestic water heating load becomes a higher percentage of that total load. And some estimates, and, and certainly these are, are estimates based on assumptions, but that the energy used for domestic water heating could range anywhere from 25 to 30% of that total annual energy use. So I did some just some quick math. If we assumed a family of four consuming 60 gallons per day of domestic water, and we start with 50 degree uh, water, take it up to 120. And if we do that with an electric heating element, uh, the coefficient of performance of an electric heating element is, is one. If we did that with a heat pump and we could assume an annual average coefficient of performance, now this would be between winter and summer. It includes all 12 months of the year. And of course, these machines in warmer weather really produce some high COPs. You can be up in the four to five COP range in, in warm conditions. Uh, so on average, if we assumed that a 2.5 COP uh, was providing that water heating, in an area that was 12 cents a kilowatt hour, we'd be saving a, about $270 a year just in domestic water heating. So domestic water heating or preheating is a significant uh, load that we want to tie in, in many cases, using an air-to-water heat pump. Now, another uh, situation, the COPs that are cited for some geothermal heat pumps do not include the power to run the circulators in the earth loop. And I put this in, this is a product that's available. Now, granted, this is a, probably a larger pumping station that you would need in a typical residential installation, but it is a, a product that has four circulators that draw 370 watts a piece. So that's almost 1500 watts of pumping power just to move the fluid through the earth loop. Uh, keep in mind now, you, you could make the argument that that energy actually becomes part of the input energy to the house in heating mode. But what about in cooling mode? That's uh, that's like another, if we converted that over to uh, BTUs per hour, that's approaching half a ton of additional heat dissipation that has to go into that earth loop. So any any uh, pumping power in cooling mode operation is, is uh, parasitic. So, uh, if you look at some of the COP ratings on certain manufacturers of geothermal heat pumps, you'll, you'll find reference to this standard ANSI 13256-2. And I've looked at that standard in a fair amount of detail. It does include a formula that is used to get an estimate of what the pumping power would be through the heat pump. But since they don't know what kind of a loop that heat pump is gonna be connected to, 
there is no inclusion of the actual pumping power for the earth loop itself, just for the heat pump. Okay, so if we actually do some math on a specific installation, I, I took a, a, a nominal heat pump here at about a, th well, a little less than a three ton nominal, uh, used manufacturer's data, came up with what the capacity is, what the flow rates are, and temperatures and so forth. And based on uh, the actual data from that manufacturer spec, I could calculate the COP. And then I added in what the electrical power would be if we had to pump through an earth loop at 10 and a half gallons per minute and including both the head loss of the heat pump as well as the head loss of the earth loop, we're approaching 36 feet of head. That's a substantial head, especially at 10.5 gallons per minute. So uh, backing that up through a wire to water efficiency in the circulator, uh, we're looking at about 287 watts of pumping power there, okay? So this COP is calculated only for the heat pump. We took the heat output and we divided it strictly by the electrical power input to run the heat pump. Then the next calculation that includes the power, not only to run the heat pump, but also to maintain circulation in the earth loop. And uh, you can see the COP drops from about 3.4 down to 3. Point, just over three. So that's a significant, it's about 11 degree drop in COP. And I, I'm a strong believer that any ancillary cost associated with running any heat pump should be included because the owner is paying for that. And I, I also like to stress the point that you don't pay for coefficient of performance. You will not find that on your utility bill. You pay for kilowatt hours. So the bottom line is what's the difference in kilowatt hours between perhaps two different types of heat pumps, all right? And again, I did a thumbnail calculation here. If we took a house in, in upstate New York in Syracuse with a 36,000 BTU per hour design load, uh, and we looked at a couple different COPs, okay? Uh, the 2.8 would be for a um, air to water unit, and the 3.28 would be for a geo unit. Now, again, you, you could, say, well, I think my heat pump will be higher than 3.28, and it could be. Uh, you could say the air source may not average over the winter 2.8, it might be more like 2.5 or 2.6. My point is you can, you can make adjustments in these numbers. The formula that's there though is, is very helpful. If you at least estimate seasonal average coefficient of performance for the entire heating season for any two heat pumps, and you want to see what the savings are, use that formula. Uh, in this case, the savings of using the higher COP geothermal heat pump over the air source was about 2.6 million BTUs per year. And if we assume that is coming from electricity at 13 cents a kilowatt hour, the math is fairly easy here. It's, it's roughly $100 a year savings. So saving $100 per year is, is you know, it's not insignificant. The question is, does it justify the cost of the earth loop? Can it recover the cost of the earth loop, especially in an unsubsidized market, in a reasonable amount of time? And you know, I'm, I'll let you draw your own conclusions on that based on what we've talked about. And obviously, there'll be local variations in what that earth loop installation cost is going to be. Uh, certainly, ductless mini split heat pumps have become a favorite in the net zero housing market. Um, the idea is we, we put a, two or three of these high wall uh, air handlers in, we run the line sets outside connected to a, a condenser unit, and in, in various uh, opinions, you'll find that uh, some people say that's all you need to know about HVAC in one of these houses. Uh, two or three high wall cassettes, line sets, outdoor condenser unit. Um, here's some uh, I took this verbatim from uh, Green Building Advisor. <clears throat> and uh, I won't read it to you, but basically it says, if you want the house to balance out temperature-wise, leave the doors open, okay? If you don't want that, uh, plan on putting some electric supplemental resistance heaters in. And I read that, and I understand it, and I'm sure you do as well, but I also see that as a compromise in comfort. The idea of uh, that the driver behind the hydronics market is superior comfort. So 
certainly some people are going to be willing to compromise comfort to accommodate various types of equipment. Uh, and that's a subjective thing. But uh, those that are involved in hydronics, certainly one of the strongest selling points in the market is unsurpassed comfort. Another thing you'll notice about COPs on uh, these ductless mini splits, uh, and you can you can try this out at the next trade show, um, ask them what their COPs are at minus five, perhaps minus 13 degrees outside. Uh, they don't really publish a lot of that data. Uh, they talk a lot about maintaining capacity, heating capacity at uh, down to and perhaps just below zero degrees Fahrenheit. They do that with uh, speeding the compressor up. Uh, but even though they can maintain good capacity, the COPs, uh, you, you can't escape the, the basic laws of thermodynamics. The COPs are suffering. They're dropping off quickly. There was a study that was done up in Vermont a few years ago, back in 2015. Here's a couple graphs that I pulled from that study. Uh, it uh, The scatter here just shows what the daily coefficient of performance were. These are cold sites. Uh, in one site there, it averaged about 1.1 at zero degrees outside. That's just a little better than electric resistance heat. At another site, it was substantially better at a 1.8 COP. So again, uh, COPs at low ambient air temperatures get the data. Uh, many of the manufacturers of air to water products do have data that goes to at least down to zero in some cases, uh, a few degrees below zero. So again, it's about comfort, okay? Uh, one of the interesting things about the ductless mini splits is when they go into a defrost mode, they have to draw heat to melt the frost on the outdoor unit. That heat has to come from the indoor air. There is no buffer tank, there is no thermal mass. That, that heat has to come from the indoor air. And during that time, that is, that is definitely a compromise in comfort. Perhaps some of you experienced that in the middle of the winter, all of a sudden the ductless mini split is blowing cold air into the space because it's in a defrost mode. Uh, with an air to water heat pump, that energy can come out of a buffer tank and you will not feel that as a, um, as a compromise in comfort. Uh, real quickly here, I'll show you some new concepts in air to water heat pumps. Uh, this is a product in the Canadian market uh, essentially, that white box in the middle is the hub of the system. Uh, it allows you to interface a standard condenser unit. That condenser can come from several different companies. Uh, it allows you to interface that with a buffer tank as well as controls for both heating and cooling. So this particular manufacturer, Therm Atlantic, has, has created this unique product, in, in my opinion, and uh, they haven't tried to sell the whole system, but they, they're selling you the key component that allows you to bring your own condenser and tie that in. And uh, especially from a control standpoint, provide some, some nice uh, features. Uh, in the PDF, you could study this in a little bit more detail. It shows you how that hub unit uh, interfaces with the condenser through a, a refrigerant line set, as well as the buffer tank. And it can interface to some low temperature heat distribution, as well as a chill water air handler for cooling. Uh, I think one of the interesting areas where we will see market growth is going to be interior air to water heat pumps. Instead of the split systems or the monoblocks we talked about earlier as, as kind of the traditional geometry of these units, uh, bring the whole unit inside and duct the outside air through short and generously sized ducting. And I'm sure you can see the idea here. We've got these large flex duct. One brings outside air in, it goes through an air handler section inside the unit, and then it goes back outside around the corner. Uh, this allows you to keep everything inside. So from a service standpoint, that's, I, that's ideal. Uh, from the standpoint of product longevity, uh, again, geo, uh, the geo market claims longer life and justifiably so the products are indoors. Well, here we have an indoor air to water heat pump. Uh, here's another manufacturer. This is a German manufacturer, Dimplex, uh, an interesting cutaway. Essentially up at the top, we have an air handling section with a coil. Uh, over here is a plan view and you can see they're basically putting this unit in the corner. They're bringing outside air in through a very short duct, running it through the air handling section and then blowing it right back outside again. 
and then the water and refrigerant circuitry, the compressor, the buffer tank, and so forth, are all integrated into the lower portion of that unit. So it's, it's a uh, special subset of air to water heat pumps. Uh, I think it has a lot of advantages. Would love to see some more product in the North American market like that. Now, thermal performance. Uh, quickly, if we look at thermal performance with any heat pump. As the outdoor air temperature goes down, the heating capacity goes down, and so does the coefficient of performance. The two lines that you see here, the two curves, uh, the blue one is for a very low temperature heating distribution system where the water temperature leaving the heat pump is 95 degrees. You'll see that capacity goes down at 131 versus uh, uh, 95, and you'll see a major hit in COP. So again, low temperature performance is really important. In cooling, it's the opposite story. The, the warmer the chill water temperature can be and still do moisture removal at the core, at the coil rather, the better the performance is going to be. Uh, with an air source heat pump, capacity drops with outside temperature. Of course, heating load goes up. We have this point in the middle called the balancing point. At that point, in theory, heating capacity of the heat pumps exactly matched with the heating load. If we go to colder temperatures, we have to supplement. That's what this orange area would represent. I've got down a boiler supplements it. It could be anything. It doesn't necessarily have to be a boiler. And then at some, some heat pumps might shut off at a certain outside temperature. I'm making the assumption in this graph that the heat pump shuts off at zero. Uh, many of the low ambient units today can go lower than zero, as low as minus 22 in, in some specifications. Uh, but if the heat pump does shut off, the boiler would assume all the load. Um, I'm going to skip a few slides. I'm looking at our clock here, and I know we don't have a lot of time left. Um, just want to talk about heat emitters very quickly. Uh, my suggestion is design your distribution system so that at design load, you only need 120 degree water temperature at the highest. And there are many heat emitters out there that you can use, uh, certainly radiant panels, uh, as well as some of the high output baseboard uh, or some panel radiators, especially panel rads that have uh, some low power fans built into them. These types of products are ideally matched with uh, these heat pumps. What you don't want to do is simply take out a boiler from a baseboard system that may have been sized around a water temperature of maybe 180 degrees, drop a heat pump in of any sort, and assume that everything's fine. They just do not operate at those high temperatures. So uh, you, you can do a couple things. You can either reduce the load to bring the water temperature down, or you can add heat emitters. Uh, Idronix 25, let me just go back there for a second. Idronix 25 goes through this in great detail. There are formulas and a much more detailed discussion of what you can do with an existing hydronic system to bring those water temperatures down. Uh, real quick, we'll go to poll question number two. Uh, so, Cody, I'll let you yeah. take that. Perfect. Thanks, John. Yeah, our next poll question, just a quick question here. Do you think that air to water heat pumps are applicable in your market? And the poll comes in at 85% saying yes. That's, uh, again, a pretty surprising one with only 15% in the no column. So. Great. Okay. Um, I'm just going to point out that in the PDF file, uh, you can take a look at some of these case studies. Uh, this was a retrofit of a, an older house in the Boston area where an air to water was added and they supplemented the existing heat emitters. There were a baseboard in there. They supplemented it with fan coils and some panel rads. Uh, they tied domestic water into it. Um, there are some other schematics in here. Here's a uh, reverse indirect tank that is buffering both the heat pump as well as uh, providing a domestic water preheat function. And uh, a small electric tankless water heater is doing the top off on the domestic hot water temperature. Uh, in the PDF files, there's a full description of operation. There's some electrical diagrams in there. A uh, couple other systems, real quick. Uh, here's one that is doing heating with radiant panels and cooling with zoned air handlers. And a common buffer tank is being used for both. Uh, again, here it is in the cooling mode. And there is a full electrical control schematic and description of operation. 
and I'm pretty sure that's it for today. So we appreciate your guys' time, and if there's any questions, don't hesitate to contact us, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Thanks John. Man. You're welcome.